join us in singing this morning as we uh, come before the Lord and worship His name. And we'll begin with uh, Change My Heart, O God. It's hymn number 654. Uh, in your hymnals or join on the screen. formalities. There's a red book in each of the pew. We ask that you sign those, pass them down. And if you're a visitor or if you have a special prayer request, there's a, an extension out on the side of the bulletin. We ask that you fill those out and turn them in as well. Um, most, there's been some announcements on the bowl, the uh, overhead, but there's a few others that I've been asked to make. The first one, Michelle sent me a a letter, there's a baby bottle placed around. Okay? It's not for a baby shower or anything. This is for Kansas Right for Life. Um, you're being asked to take one home and fill it full of change and then turn it in in uh, a week or two to help support that cause. Um, there's some back here on this table. There's some on the tables out in the foyer and that. So, Please, there, there's lots of them that have been picked up already, but there's still more that need to be filled. If we can do that. Um, the other thing, Jeff wanted me to remind all those that had signed up for softball, if you look in the newsletter, first of all, there is a schedule. There's only five teams this year, so there's one game each night. Uh, there's actually two games, but it's all at 645. And the first Baptist team plays at, at that time on field three. So if you've signed up, make sure you you show up. And uh, if you don't play, come down and watch. You know they can sure need the support and that. And that. Uh, one other announcement that they had was ladies outing on June 24th. They're working on that. If you're interested, you know get with Kim and Diana and. Uh, they're, they're trying to work out the, the details on that, so get with them on that. Are there any other announcements that need to be, to be made? If you missed Sunday school today, you, you missed a true treat. Um, heard a lot about Victory Village. Had a wonderful breakfast. 
It was truly amazing. As I was reading the book that we're doing in Sunday School, Destined for the Throne, I was reading along and there was a statement that just really stuck out in my mind. It just came out and I, I don't know, I just never thought about it before. The statement was, he, referring to God, or Christ, did not conquer Satan for himself. Have you thought about that? It said that God, if he wanted to, could have gone out. He threw Satan down before. He could throw him out again. But he didn't do it for himself. If you look at Ephesians 2, 4 through 6, it says, But God, is, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loves us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up together, and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. God could have taken the easy way out and did it all by himself. But where would we be? The other statement it says is when Christ defeated Satan, it was our victory. A victory that God gave to us. Each one of us are unique. There's not a one of us that are the same. And we're all created for a special purpose. And it's through this loving God that we have is why we are here today to worship and to praise him. And, uh, you know, during service today, we're, we're going to be blessed because we're going to hear, hear from one of the uh, missions that we support, Victory Village, and, uh, and the fact that they recognize each and every one of us is unique and special, loved by God, a desire that no one else can express so greatly as God does for us to join him and be with him. Having no more announcements, I'd like to invite you all to stand up and to greet those around you. <laughs> Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just stand before you in awe, awe of the sacrifice that you've made, the fact that you sent your Son to suffer upon that cross. Not only that, but you endured the separation from your Son while he was here on earth. That you were able to put forth yourself recognize that God you were suffering as well when, when Christ was denied on the cross a denial that he didn't deserve a denial for the pure the, the, the righteous and we just praise you for that we pray that you help us to recognize that this love that you have for us gives us a special spot, a special desire that you have for us, the fact that you showed your grace, your mercy to us, and all we have to do is step forward and say, you are my God. We offer this offering for you, knowing that you can do great things with it. We just ask that you bless it, to use it in the furtherance 
of your cause. In your name we pray. If you will stand again and join as we sing our hymn of worship, number 690 of the hymnal, or you can join us on the screen.
let's look to the Lord in prayer, shall we? Our Father, we're so grateful for a beautiful morning. This truly is the day that you've made, and we rejoice. We're glad. We're glad that we can be in the house of the Lord. If you think of the psalmist who said, I was glad when they said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. We ask, Lord, your blessing be upon this service today. Thank you for opportunity of coming home and seeing people we haven't seen in a long time and also bringing those along with us who've come to mean so much to us. We ask your blessing upon this church and upon its outreach here in this community and through its mission extension in various parts of the world. Lord, we know there are probably many needs represented here this morning. We pray for any who are sick. We pray for those that have special special needs in their lives and just ask that you would reach down your hand and uh, just comfort and strengthen and give grace to all who need it. We pray, Lord, for our nation, for our country. We know there are many needs and we pray for leaders and those in places of responsibility, both in the state and in the nation. God, we ask that they would look to you for wisdom and we ask that you would bestow that wisdom because you have told us that you will give when we ask. Lord, we thank you again for this time, and we just pray your blessing on the remaining time in this service that we might honor and glorify Jesus. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. Okay. I guess I'm not quite familiar with all your protocol, but uh, I'm here. I can't help but do a little reminiscing in coming home, and I did some of this in the Sunday school hour, so I hope you'll permit me just to do a little bit more right now, but I was sitting here thinking about a lot of things. I believe that the uh, first time I ever preached from this pulpit must have been about, um, well, it had to have been somewhere around 1970, a little before that. Uh, I can't remember the exact date. I can remember faces. I can remember the face of my grandpa, who used to sit right over here, I think, a good bit of the time. Some of you remember Tom Cowell, maybe. I don't know if anybody does or not. That's been a long time ago. I remember Fred Yarrow and Margaret, and I better not start naming names. I can think of a lot more, but uh, I get in trouble, I'll leave somebody out. But it's just good to be home. Good to see all of you. I should also mention some of our closest neighbors. Good to see Bonnie Glenn over here this morning. People I went to high school with, uh, people that I knew that mean a lot. There was a song I remember was popular, I think, back in those days. I love those dear hearts and gentle people who live in love in my hometown. Anybody remember that old song? So I think about that in connection with Clay Center and Clay County. And I mentioned in Sunday school how uh, uh, Larry and I used to do a lot of things together um, when um, I remember on Saturday night. Saturday night was the time to go to town. When uh, I was young, everybody went to town, did their shopping, and did their visiting. They uh, visited with with each other, and I remember how we used to run around, and I begged my dad for 15 cents to buy an Andy Pandy comic book. Um, sometimes he gave in, sometimes he didn't, but uh, those are all good memories. And uh, along with them, some memories of, of spiritual experiences. I just pulled this out of the file before it came this morning, but... There is my baptismal certificate. You and I were baptized at the same time right here in the baptistry on the 10th day of August in 1947. That's been a while back, hasn't it? And uh, thank God for the way that he's led both of us and the way he's blessed through the years. My pilgrimage, spiritual pilgrimage started pretty early because my folks were Christ good Christian people. Some of you knew Horst and Dorothy Cowell. And my mother read me a little booklet one time called uh, Will You Come? Here it is. Uh, it was preserved in some of her things. Uh, you wouldn't believe all the stuff my mom kept. And I didn't know either until we got to cleaning out her things. But this little book she read me was published by the American Baptist Publication Society. And it was an invitation to accept Jesus. And when she got to the end of the book, I said, I want to, I want to do that. And uh, we were just in our living room at home, and she said, are you sure you know what you're doing? Uh, yes, I know what I'm doing. I want to do that. And so I signed my name. There it is. I went by Billy during those times because that was what my mom called me. 
Uh, November the 4th, 1944 was the date on that. So that puts it back quite a bit further. But we thank God for the way that uh, he has led through the years. And it's all been his grace and his mercy. And I used to ride the horse out on the farm through the pasture, and I used to say, God, I know you have a girl somewhere you want me to marry someday. I don't know where she is, but, uh, you know, I want you to lead me to her. And it took a few years. Um, I went through K-State, and I went to, went to Wheaton, Illinois, and uh, didn't know I had to go so far from home to meet somebody that lived 60 miles from me. <laughs> but uh, Carol was at Moody Bible Institute. I was at Wheaton College, and I met a fellow in the lunch line one night. His name was Roger. He was from Fort Scott, Kansas. And we were visiting, and pretty soon he said, How old are you? I'm 21, Roger. Why, why did you ask? Well, he said, I know a girl at Moody Bible Institute, and I want to go see her. And they have some really strict rules there. And if I want to take her anywhere, I have to have a chaperone. I have to have somebody who's, who's 21. He said, Would you consider going along being my chaperone? Oh, I think I could do that. And so uh, next Sunday, we made our way into Chicago and went to the Moody Bible Institute and, and uh, got to Houghton Hall, and Kara wasn't down from her room yet. And so Roger said, well, I think I'll go over to Crow Hall and see if she's over there. If you see a girl that looks like this, and he showed me a picture, he said, tell her Roger was looking for her. As soon as he left, the elevator door opened, and out she came. That was my first glimpse of Carol. And uh, so I said, are you Carol Weber? Yes. Well, Roger was looking for you. So I followed him around Chicago that day. Um, that was the beginning. But later on, I said, uh, I found out Roger had another girlfriend in Kansas. And I thought, well, maybe there's some hope for me here. So I said, what would you think if I go see her? Oh, yeah, go ahead if you want to. I found a reason to go to Chicago right away. And uh, stopped and called her down from her room and chatted. And she didn't quite know what was going on. I guess I didn't either. But anyway, here we are. This summer will be 52 years that we've been married. And uh, the Lord has been good. And we just thank Him for all that He's done along the way. And I guess we're here to do more than reminisce this morning, but uh, I just wanted to start out with that and just say it's good to be here, First Baptist Church. This looks almost the same as it did. I'm glad you kept your old sanctuary. So many churches got rid of theirs and built something else, but I'm glad you have this. It just brings back a lot of memories. <coughs> And uh, just thank God for the ministry of this church. And we're glad to identify ourselves with you. Honey, I think it's time for you to come and talk a little bit. So if you would just... Dean, I apologize for my eyes and dizziness and cataracts. Um, I want to read a letter that we, we received from a girl who was with us probably 25 years ago. And uh, we, we keep in contact with a lot of the girls. In fact, one of the very first girls we ever had, we have contact with. She's a grandmother. Uh, she was a teacher. She taught special ed art and uh, was very successful in doing that. She's doing very well. But this letter starts out, Dear Ones at Victory Village, I don't think you will ever truly know how much Victory Village has influenced my life to the very fullest extent, from the things I believe God to be and my relationship with Him, to the way I relate to my husband, raise my children, and function in society. Being sent away from a very privileged life, so far from home, for the very first time, not because of cultural experience or a higher education, but because I was bad. Too much for my parents to deal with anymore. To be raised by strangers during the most influential time in a person's life should have been the most de devastating event of my life. Instead, however, it was the very best thing that could have happened to me. It was traumatic, sure, and would be for any teenage girl. But I'm pretty sure it was only a matter of time before I got into some really dangerous trouble. <clears throat> if left on the path I had chosen for myself. But because of that wonderful place, I like to call the village, my life was to be forever changed for the better. 
when Tom, that was her husband, got sick in 2009, my world crumbled around me. He almost died, obviously, but he didn't die. Um, without the spiritual foundation set up for me as a teenage girl, set up by God, what, what you taught me all those years ago was my strength and my drive and my focus through the most difficult time of my life. When I'm tempted to throw my hands up and quit, I remember the things I learned at Victory Village. When I feel like my husband will never change, so why should I even bother trying to? When my teenage son breaks my heart with careless words or severs an already delicate bridge of trust, when I start feeling like maybe I've messed up and he's just going to stay on the wrong path all the way into adulthood, making the same foolish and dangerous mistakes that I made or worse, I remember how you all believed in me always, no matter what it looked like or how much trouble I got myself into. I knew you loved me, and I was starving for that kind of love. You saw through all the smoke screens, all the lies, all the hurt, all the hatefulness and ugliness, all the way into the heart of each and every one of us, no matter how hard any one of us would fight to keep you out. You never ever gave up on anyone. You believed in each and every girl at that school. And even when the circumstances were as grave as any outlook could get, even when she had given up on herself, you never gave up and never would. Not all were receptive, but those of us who were, like me, learned how to believe in herself. By your example, if you could be that faithful, that gracious, that determined to, even, to never give up, then maybe I'm worth something after all. Maybe I am worth believing in. I remember that what I value most of all, the lessons I learned there. God's love is unconditional. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. You introduced me to the Creator and showed me that he was not just the Creator of all things, but Creator of all things Kelly. That, that was your name, but not any Kellys that she grows in. Uh, the creator and lover of my soul. How do you thank a person for that? I think that's why he promises to give us a reward in heaven for the things we do while on earth, because there really is no adequate gift of thanks that would suffice. So I would just say, from the bottom of my heart, I thank you. And then she signs for me. All right, I think it's time to meet everybody. So let's have everyone come up to the platform, please. I want you to find out everybody's name and where they come from. And uh, so, we're just going to fit here, aren't we? Let's start here. I'm Kelly, I'm from Texas. I'm Peyton, and I'm from Utah. I'm Daniela, and I'm from Colorado. I'm Brittany, and I'm from Pratt. I'm Sammy, and I'm from Winfield. Grace, from Haiti. I'm Callie, I'm from Hillsborough. I'm Jada, I'm from Hutch. I'm Retina, I'm from Wichita. I'm Angel, I'm from Kansas City. I'm Lunasha, I'm from Ethiopia. I'm Carrie, I'm from Guatemala. We have an international group from all over. Well, we're going to start out by saying a very familiar passage of scripture this morning, the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. We're going to do a little singing for you, and uh, 
Then we're going to intersperse the songs with some testimonies and hope that as we share in this way this morning that you might be blessed and that also you'll have a burden on your heart to pray for us, to pray for Victory Village, to pray for all those who make up our group. I try to do a lot of things at once here, so you'll have to kind of pardon me if I have to shuffle things around a little bit. self-destructive behavior. I had convinced myself that I would be in mental hospitals for the rest of my life. When I was told I was going to Victory Village, I could admit that I wasn't the happiest girl in the world. I was very scared that the girls there would not understand what I was going through. I was very close-minded about going to Christian's girls' home, of how a Christian girls' home could help someone who was addicted to self-harm. I could never tell you how wrong I was. I found out that I am not alone. There were girls there who had similar, similar struggles to what I had that I had become very close to. Victory Village has helped me so much. I will never be able to thank Bill and Carol and all the staff enough. Everyone has been rooting for me to overcome my self-mutilation problem. Since arriving at Victory Village three and a half months ago, I have successfully not cut for 47 days. That may not seem like a lot of days in the grand scheme of life, but coming from a girl who swore up and down that she would never stop self-harming, those days mean the world to me. Thank you so much for believing in me and being there for me through all my ups and downs.
first label. I didn't have a good relationship with my mother. I never had an adult to look up to. Because of that, I was always in some kind of trouble. I had a very crazy lifestyle with my mother and couldn't ever find and my mother couldn't, couldn't ever find a guy to stay with us that was good enough for everyone. We moved from house to house and always, I always had to make new friends, but we never stayed long enough to actually, for me to actually get to know anyone. So I just uh, gave up on having friends and opening up to people. Then because I was holding everything in, I got really depressed thinking that for the rest of my life I would be just like my mother. And I also wanted better for my brother. I, my mother. I hated the world and because of that I took it out I took my all my rage out on my mother. I never realized how bad I hurt her until I got sent to Victory Village. My mother couldn't stop crying. I felt so miserable that I told myself I had to change. I looked for God it God, it took a little while, but I found him and I got baptized on March 29th, of 2015. I have never felt better in my life. Thanks to God I will be ready for college by the end of next school year. Many of the songs we sing are chosen by the students, and not long ago, one of our girls picked this song out, and uh, she liked it, and we all came to like it, and so we're going to sing it for you. Then 
when I got to middle school, I was picked on and made fun of because of many reasons. I got to high school. In the middle of freshman year, I was sent to Victory Village. The first year, I think, was the hardest because I was new and it was a different place for me. I wasn't used to being in a place like this before. I was baptized again several months after I got to Victory Village. And I'm glad that I was because I wasn't, I wasn't, and because if I wasn't, I don't know where I would be anymore. I am now 17 and going on 18. I will be honest, I'm scared, but God has a plan for my future, so all I have to do is trust in the Lord for the answers. Earlier, we do a lot of uh, 
of Bible reading and we encourage scripture memorization. We're working on something, and maybe we're not quite ready to do it this morning, but we're going to do it anyway. I should know this pretty well. Years ago, when Aunt Annie, some of you know Aunt Annie, my Aunt Annie Cowell, who was in Africa for 45 years, she was staying with us one Sunday afternoon. My folks had gone someplace, and Aunt Annie encouraged me to memorize scripture. And she showed me a little book. She had a little uh, notebook, and she said, when I memorize verses, I write them down in here. And so I was quick to want to do what Aunt Annie said, and so I got a little notebook, and I started memorizing scripture. And that afternoon, if I remember correctly, I memorized Matthew 5, 1 to 16. Now, I stumble around a little bit on it now because that's been a long time ago. But we've been reading and uh, going over the Beatitudes. And so we're going to do that for you this morning before we have everyone sit down. Now, when he saw the crowds, he went up into a mountainside and sat down. And the disciples came to him, and he began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Words of Jesus, how important they are. The Beatitudes address a lot of different areas of life, don't they? They talk about lots of different situations and things that uh, are very, very practical. And I think we need to give particular attention to things that Jesus said. Not all Bibles are what we call red letter editions. Um, in fact, I'm not sure I've seen too many anymore. I happen to have one here in front of me right now where the letters of Jesus are in red. I don't like to think that any part of the Bible is more important than others, and yet I think we probably could say that. I think the words of Jesus are a lot more important than the description of some bloody battle in the Old Testament someplace. And so uh, I don't hesitate to say that we need to give very special attention to the words of Jesus and what he had to say to the people that he ministered to and to those uh, that he was around. There was a man in Topeka uh, many, many years ago, in fact around the late 1800s, I believe, by the name of Charles Sheldon. Anybody recognize that name? Charles Sheldon was pastor of the Congregational Church in Topeka, and he wrote a book called In His Steps. Actually, the book was a series of messages he gave there in his church, and then he put it in a book, and this uh, sort of came to life again a few years back when people resurrected this, this uh, little uh, saying, what would Jesus do? And if you remember, it, People were wearing uh, bracelets that had WWJD on it. What would Jesus do? And it was a reminder of uh, what Jesus would do in certain situations. I think that uh, if we want to know what Jesus would do, then we ought to know what Jesus did when he lived on this earth. And so if we take a look in the Gospels and in many of the uh, passages of Scripture, I'm going to share just briefly with you this morning, we are going to see what did Jesus do. Now, what did he say? What did he do? This is important as far as guiding our own lives. The Sermon on the Mount. We just said the Beatitudes. He also said here to let your light so shine before others. He said that we are to love our enemies. We're to bless those who curse us. He says we are to settle matters quickly with our adversaries. Do not let our acts of righteousness show off to others. In other words, don't do things just to be seen of other people. He said, don't pray like the hypocrites. To be seen and to be heard, but to pray more secretly. 
Don't hoard money where it can end up being lost. But use your money for the furtherance of God's kingdom. He said we shouldn't worry about things in this life. He said we should seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added to us. He said we ought not judge other people. We ought not to pick out specks in other people's eyes when we may have a board sticking out of our own eye. Now, it's an exaggeration. It's a hyperbole. It's a conscious exaggeration for effect. But so many times we look around and we see specks in people. All the while, we may be overlooking something much worse in our... Now, those are just some of the things that Jesus said. And uh, what were some of the things that he did? Those were what he said. Well... We find in the, in the Gospel of Matthew, as I just went, kind of went through this, we find where he mixed with tax collectors and with sinners. Over in Matthew chapter 9, it tells us that he, he uh, ate with people that the religious crowd didn't approve of. They saw him doing all this and they said, well, he shouldn't be mixing with those people. He shouldn't be with them. He taught, he preached, he healed, he showed compassion, he encouraged us to do the same. And he didn't, didn't mind the kind of people he was with because he had what they needed. And because he didn't judge them or because he didn't look down upon them in all of their needs and all of the, the problems that they had, they listened to him. And many of their lives were changed. Remember how the religious man came to, to Jesus, Nicodemus, and uh, he was one of the higher religious people at that time. And uh, he was hungry and thirsty for what Jesus had to say. Jesus told him how to be born again. And then there were others that had uh, various needs. Some of them had great moral needs. Some of them were religious needs. Some of them had physical needs. And he met those needs. And so we see plenty in the Gospels about what Jesus did and also about what we should do in relation to that. I've thought of some things here that I just want to share with you this morning uh, along this line. You've probably heard this story. Um, it's been around a long time. But I think that it, it really has a lot of meaning for us. It's, uh, it's about a man named, about a boy named Tim. His name is Tim. He has wild hair, wears a t-shirt with holes in it, jeans, no shoes. This was literally his wardrobe for his entire four years of college. He's brilliant, kind of profound, and very bright. He became a Christian while attending college. Across the street from the campus is a well-dressed, very conservative church. They want to develop a ministry to the students, but they really aren't sure how to go about it. One day, Tim decides to go there. He walks in, no shoes jeans, his t-shirt, his wild hair. The service has already started, so Tim starts down the aisle looking for a seat. The church is completely packed. He can't find a seat. By now, people are really looking a bit uncomfortable, but no one says anything. Tim gets closer and closer and closer to the pulpit. And when he realizes there are no seats, he just squats down right on the carpet. And now the people are really uptight, and the tension in the air is thick. About this time, the minister realizes that from way back at the back of the church, a deacon is slowly making his way down the aisle toward Tim. Now, the deacon is in his 80s, has silver-gray hair, a three-piece suit, a godly man, very elegant, very dignified, very courtly. He walks with a cane, and as he starts walking toward the boy, everyone is saying to themselves, you can't blame him for what he's going to do. How can you expect a man of his age, of his background, to understand some college kid sitting down on the floor of the church? It takes a long time for the man to reach the boy. The church is utterly silent. Except for the clicking of the man's cane, all eyes are focused on him. You can't even hear anyone breathing. The minister can't preach the sermon until the deacon does what he has to do. And now they see this elderly man drop his cane on the floor and with great difficulty lowers himself and sits down next to Tim and worships with him so he won't be alone. 
Everyone chokes up with emotion. What the minister, when the minister finally gains control, he says, what I'm about to preach this morning, you will never remember, but what you have just seen, you will never forget. Be careful how you live. You may be the only Bible that some people will ever read. That last statement is one that I remember my mother using many, many years ago. In fact, she had a little thing written out. You might be the only Bible that some people may ever read. When they look at your life and they sense how you relate to other people and how much you reflect the spirit of Jesus Christ. If we were to go on in the Gospels, we'd find story after story after story about Jesus related to people. How he met them in their place where they were. He met them in the time of their need. And this is a lesson that we've had to learn through the years. When we started this work many, many years ago, uh, you wouldn't believe all the lessons we've had to learn, and some of them the hard way. When we first started out 45 years ago, I guess maybe we had the idea that, uh, you know, for those that were a little on the trouble side, if we would just take them and provide enough structure and maybe the right kind of discipline at the right time, then maybe everything would straighten out. But you know what? we came to realize that that is not really what it takes. People do not, do not care what you know until they know how much you care. And that again is a statement you've probably heard used a lot of times, but people don't really care much about what you know, all the knowledge you can have until they know that you really care about it. Then they become interested. I thank God for our group. I really do. Girls, I praise God for you. Carol and I both thank God for you and our staff. Every morning, it's, it's Carol and my privilege to spend 30, 30 minutes in our school. We sort of have, I said earlier, we had a pastoral role at Victory Village. And we spend 30 minutes in which time we sing and uh, we read the scripture and we watch a bit of a movie and we just have a good time together. We pray, of course, and talk to God and and uh, we just have some really, really great times. And we find out that relationships are established. Relationships are built. And the letter that Carol read a little bit ago, I remember this girl was from Tennessee. She didn't mention that. But um, when she was with us, uh, she was not one of the easier ones that we've ever had at Victory Village. But we thank God for what he saw fit to do in her life over the time that she was there and the time after she left. Sometimes it doesn't all happen to Victory Village. That's where the seed is planted. You know, Paul said in one of his letters, I planted, Apollos came along and watered, but God gave the increase. And we find out that we have the privilege of planting the seed and then maybe somebody else does a little cultivating and watering sort of like a crop you raise, you know, and somebody reaps the harvest at a later time. And it's that relationship that's established that is so vitally important. I found this, in fact, it was taken from a, a speaker on Back to the Bible broadcast so, several years ago, and I thought it was worth remembering. And it says, what do you do for teenagers who are not respectful to you? Now, all these, all these uh, teenagers we have are respectful to us. I'm not addressing anything that, but uh, there have been times when people have been disrespectful. But the question is, what do you do? when somebody's disrespectful to you. Sometimes we parents have to bite our lips and take a lot of disrespect in the teenage years. That ultimately will turn itself around if they see us being kind and respectful to them, even when they are not respectful of us. And you know what? You don't have to tell teenagers when they're being disrespectful. I mean, they know it. So if we respond to them in disrespect, they'll simply work off of that and respond to us in disrespect. And eventually, thank God, as teenagers grow up and as a process of growing up, they're going to see that the disrespect they paid to you was not retaliated by disrespect back to them. And that's, by the way, one of the ways we have to show respect, not just for our parents, but also for our children. I mean, when you talk about respect, we tend to think about respecting those who are older than we are, but how about respecting those who are younger than us, being just as important? Yes, it's important how we establish relationships 
and how we continue in ministry as we go along. I think most of you, and I don't have to remind you of this, know that Carol and I aren't getting any younger. Uh, we still feel young. I mean, I, I try to do everything I feel like doing. So uh, how long ago it was? A few weeks ago, we all went to the Mennonite relief sale in Hutchinson, and we entered the 5K race. I think everybody did. Um, I know Carol said she did, but uh, she was there. Uh, but anyway, we try to do all we can, and, uh, and I want to tell you this. Katie did a great job as a basketball coach. This was something new this year. It was something that, that our school hasn't had before. If you've been there, some of you have been there, and you probably saw our gymnasium in pretty bad shape. Any of you remember what the gymnasium looked like? It was kind of a storage place, really. We built it a long time ago, but then we, you know, we'd play in it a little bit, and then we'd pile stuff in there to kind of, you know, put it someplace while we decided what to do with it and all that kind of thing. And, well, Katie got a vision. She said, I want to help clean this place out. And so she uh, arranged for a truck, and uh, she arranged for a bunch of people to come. She's been associated with the Kansas Bible Camp there at Hutchinson, and she had a lot of friends from there, and they came out, and boy, I tell you, you wouldn't believe all the stuff we threw away. But you know what? Every once in a while I think about something, I think, you know what, if we still had that old stuff out there, I'd probably find something I could use. Uh, I'm glad we don't have it, Katie. I always find another way. But, uh, you, you know, the... Uh, the fact that we try to, to identify with the young people, and uh, I don't get out to play basketball. I'm not a basketball player uh, to start with. Uh, Katie was. Katie played on the basketball team at Sterling College, so she knows what she's doing. But, you know, we thank God for the fact that we do have younger leadership coming up. And this is what's important. We want to continue on as long as God gives us strength in the role that he wants us to have. And uh, I'm so thankful we don't have to do what we used to do, what we did for many, many years. God saw us through those times. But now we have, we have younger people, we have those that are taking the reins and, and helping out, and this is so encouraging. And I hope it's encouraging to our supporting churches, to know that you're not supporting a sinking ship. Uh, I don't think anybody wants to give to something they think is going to, you know, finally is going to play out one of these days. Uh, now, I, I don't believe necessarily institutions are immortal, but I do think that it's good to see organizations carry on if we have the right kind of uh, leadership and the right kind of, uh, of uh, transition from one generation to the next. I want to give you an illustration that comes from Max Lucado. Some of you may have read, he's a great writer. He has a lot of books. And uh, he had this story not so long ago. And I want to just share it with you this morning because it illustrates what we want. When we started this work, we said uh, we don't want this to be called Cowell Ministries. That just doesn't sound right. And I can remember in the old Emanuel Baptist Church in Marion where we pastored I remember where I was in that auditorium when something hit me one day. I thought, if we ever started work for young people, I want it to be called Heart Ministries. And that's where the name came from. We call it Heart Ministries. It doesn't have our name attached to it. It's, this is God's work. And so whether it's us or somebody else, the important thing is the ministry. But I think you'll get the lesson, you get the, the message I'm trying to give here as I share this story from Max Lucado. Unfavorable winds blow the ship off course. And when they do, the sailors spot uncharted islands. They see a half a dozen mounds rising out of the blue South Sea waters. The captain orders the men to drop anchor and goes ashore. He's a robust man with a barrel chest, full beard, curious soul. On the first island, he sees nothing but sadness, underfed children, tribes in conflict, no farming or food development, no treatment for the sick, no schools. <coughs> Just simple, needy people. The second and following islands reveal more of the same. The captain sighs at what he sees. This is no life for these people, but what can he do? Then he steps onto the last and the largest island. The people are healthy. They're well fed. Irrigation systems nourish the fields, 
Roads connect the villages. The children have bright eyes and strong bodies. The captain asks the chief for an explanation. How has this island moved so far ahead of the other? The chief, who is smaller than the captain, but every bit his equal in confidence, gives a quick response. Why, it's Father Benjamin. He educated us in everything from agriculture to health. He built schools. He built clinics. He dug wells. The captain asks, can you take me to see him? The chief nods and signals for two tribesmen to join him. They guide the captain over a jungle ridge to a simple, expansive medical clinic. It's equipped with clean beds, staffed with trained caretakers. They show the captain the shelves of medicines and introduce him to the staff. The, cap the captain, though impressed, sees nothing of Father Benjamin. He repeats his request. I would like to see Father Benjamin. Can you take me to where he lives? The three natives look puzzled. They confer among themselves. After several minutes, the chief invites, follow us to the other side of the island. They walk along the shoreline until they reach a series of fish ponds. Canals connect the ponds to the ocean. As the tide rises, fish pass from the ocean into the ponds. The islanders then lower canal gates and trap the fish for the harvest. Again, the captain's amazed. He meets fishermen, he meets workers, he meets gatekeepers and net casters, but he sees nothing of Father Benjamin. He wonders if he's making himself clear. I don't see Father Benjamin. Please take me to where he lives. The trio talks alone again. After some discussion, the chief offers, let's go up the mountain. They lead the captain up a steep, narrow path. After many twists and turns, the path deposits them in front of a grass roof chapel. The voice of the chief is soft and earnest. He has taught us about God. He escorts the captain inside, and he shows him the altar, a large wooden cross, several rows of benches, and a Bible. Is this where Father Benjamin lives, the captain asks? The men nod, and they smile. May I talk to him? Their faces grow suddenly serious. Oh, that would be impossible. Well, why? Well, he died many years ago. The bewildered captain stares at the men. I asked to see him, and you showed me a clinic. You showed me some fish farms. And now this chapel. You said nothing about his death. Well, you didn't ask me about his death, the, cat, the chief explains. You asked to see where he lives. And we showed you. I hope the point is clear. That we want to live on in, not in name, <clears throat> not in our own names, but with fruit. With fruit that lasts. Uh, God gave us the first when we started out from John, the 15th chapter. He said, uh, the verse says, you've not chosen me, but I've chosen you. And I've ordained you that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should remain, should last. And uh, that's what we want to see happen with our ministries. We want there to be fruit. Carol read a letter from a girl named Kelly this morning. No, we've had a lot of Kellys. But this girl was with us 20 years ago, probably, I don't know, 15, 20 years ago. That's fruit that it remains. The one she mentioned in Texas, in, in the, uh, down in South Texas, uh, has been a teacher. And uh, we hear from her. We keep in touch with her. In fact, we have her on Facebook. <laughs> I suppose a lot of you people are on Facebook. It's a good way to keep in touch with people and uh, even use it in ministry. But anyway, when, when our days are over, and we don't know when that will be, none of us know. But when it's over, we want what we've tried to do for the last 45 years to last, not with our name on it, but in fruit that remains. And fruit, not just that remains here, but fruit for everlasting life, for eternal life, for eternity. It's been good to be with you this morning. I'm not sure the plans for the close. Are you going to close the service? Okay. Then I think I'll just let you come and do that. Thank you so much for sharing, all of you, for sharing this morning.
appreciate that. Um, now if we uh, stand, you're able and join in the hymn of invitation. Um, I need thee, verse 1 and 2 in your hymnal, uh, page 638 or on the screen. And if there's any of you who have been touched this morning um, or that have been led uh, in a decision, uh, I just pray that you will feel forward to come forward this morning and share that. And I'm sure there will be a deacon to, uh, that can pray with you, too, if you feel led to do that. So let's join as we close with I need the area every hour. Thank you. 